Now, of course, Owen, this is a song to do. This is for really to mark the end of Memorial Day. Uh, and I think even the, uh, looking at the images, even our viewers who don't understand the Hebrew words will understand the meaning and the emotions in this particular song. That's right, Kalev, and also tell viewers outside of Israel that throughout the course of the past 24 hours, Israeli radio stations have been playing continuously songs like this one, songs in keeping with the mood of Yom Hazikaron, of Memorial Day, and trying to establish that mood throughout the country. This is what makes Israel's Memorial Day so very special and poignant, Kalev, in comparison with Memorial Days in many other parts of the world. Of course, the sense of loss very real here because of the number of conflicts and wars and the number of fallen over the course of the past 72 years and many, many more, even before the founding of the state. And of course, this part of the ceremony meant to really drive home what we spoke about a few moments ago, that abrupt transition between Memorial Day to Independence Day. Again, that tradition that, that's even much deeper than the state of Israel itself, that really is a deep theme in the Jewish tradition and in Jewish history, let alone in the events of the 20th century itself. And indeed, it's uh, certainly telling. Uh, this, uh, they, the broadcast could just start with the more festive opening of Independence Day, but it's a deliberate choice to just give us about just about five minutes ceremony closing out Memorial Day again so that Israelis understand the prices that were made in order for there to be a celebration on Independence Day. Look, Aleb, we've had other ceremonies over the course of the past 24 hours, no shortage of them, even in these strange times, to mark Memorial Day. But it is essential to the experience of Memorial Day and Independence Day that it be done exactly this way, that it be done with this kind of abrupt transition on this kind of prominent stage, again, being beamed maybe this night more than others because everyone is in their homes onto the television screens of people in Israel and throughout the world to drive home the abrupt transition from Memorial Day to Independence Day and, and, and all that it symbolizes. Right. And we unfortunately have to note, even though the country, of course, is grappling with the coronavirus pandemic, just as every other nation in the world, we did see a terror attack today on a woman who is in uh, stable condition. Uh, and that was a reminder that even with all that's going on with the coronavirus pandemic, Israel's still facing this violent struggle for its legitimacy. And of course, Memorial Day is honoring both soldiers that, uh, or people who uh, lo lost their lives while in active military duty or in recent years also victims of terrorism. And that has to be, unfortunately, a reminder of that just this very day. That's right. History hasn't come to a sharp pause, Kalev. It, it continues. And again, we saw evidence of that today as well. Um, but look, again, even, even when we speak about the pandemic itself, the, as you know, the Army in recent weeks has played a very prominent role. The Home Front Command, in some sense, feeding the city of B'nai Brak, uh, that Orthodox, Orthodox stronghold that had become a hot spot. Let's go back to the ceremony. Yeah. Daglanim, Dagel, Chick. Daglanim, Achtev, check. Is go. Go. Is go by Dr. Itai Pesach, Director, Pediatric Hospital and ICU for Corona Patients in the Sheba Tel Hashomer Hospital. Itai is the son of Major Dani Pesach, who fell in battle when he was a commander of a tank unit in one of the most harsh and heroic battles in the Golan Heights. Dani was survived by his wife Nirit and by his son Itai, one year old. His daughter was born after he fell. He was 27 years old. 
May the people of Israel remember its sons and daughters, loyal and brave, the soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces, its underground fighters and combatants in Israel's war, and all the members of the intelligence community and police and security forces who gave their lives in the struggle for the redemption of the State of Israel, and all those who were murdered here in Israel and beyond, may all Israel remember and be blessed by their offspring and mourn the loss of the beauty of youth, the sanctity of their willingness. May we cherish in our hearts the memory of those heroes of Israel's victorious battles. The ceremony will begin by raising the Israeli flag to the mast head. Dagel, check! Well, here we are starting now at the beginning of the Israel Independence Day ceremony. I just want to comment, you talked about the role the army has played in fighting this coronavirus. We saw a sort of an illustration just in the previous segment. Uh, we saw the son of a fallen war hero, but himself now a medical professional on the front line of the struggle against the coronavirus. So sort of that connection is made, Owen. And in fact, as we'll see during this ceremony, especially in the torch lighting uh, uh, celebration part of its ceremony, an emphasis on the struggle against the coronavirus. That's right, Clive. It will be a theme throughout the ceremony, although as we can see on our screens right now, not the only theme. Of course, there will still be the traditional themes of Yom Atzmaut, of Israel's Independence Day, and the celebration of Israeli culture that comes along with it. Right. I do want to clarify, we do see in some of the footage people wearing masks. Some of the other footage, if you see people, groups close together, that was filmed prior, of course, to the coronavirus pandemic. That's something the organizers wanted us to say to understand that there was no violation in making uh, this ceremony. Let's go now to the ceremony. Truth be told, such an Independence Day we never had before. These are different times. Israel is grappling with a crisis the likes of which we never experienced, as if everything that makes us Israelis has been taken away, the warmth, the touch, the hug. However, our connection to one another is much deeper than that. The more they tell us to keep a distance, the more our hearts become closer. Every request to separate only proves to what extent we're all together in this struggle, and everyone starts to do more for one another. Civilians, as well as security people, volunteers, and medical staff, all of us take care of all of us. And so this is the first time in the history of the torchlighting ceremony that there is no flag-bearing marches, no dance troops, and no audience on top of this mountain. However, it is with millions of viewers in Israel and abroad and with a real and deep connection that makes us who we are. This year especially, the Israeli flag is flying high. Twelve torches will be kindled and a great joy will resonate from here, from Herzl Mount in Jerusalem, through the entire country and the world. The speech of Prime Minister, Member of Knesset, Benjamin Netanyahu. Brothers and sisters, Citizens of Israel, such an Independence Day we've never had before. We are physically distanced, but we're very close to one another 
as never before. In the last few weeks, uh, we stood to a test. We had to make decisions, and we did it all together. We did it with mutual help to the other in cooperation and even sharing recipes. We took care of mother and father and grandparents, and we understood that in the time of Corona, love is distance. Soon enough, we'll start hugging again, but we're still not there because the pandemic is still around us, and that's why we have to continue to listen to the orders in order to take care of one another. We all thank wholeheartedly to the wonderful doctors, men and women, to the nurses, men and women, to the medical staff, to the labs, to the police people, and I sent them a virtual hug and a very warm elbow. Together we all mobilize to this very important mission of saving lives. We cry for every loss, but we're very happy that the State of Israel is graded very high among the developed countries in preserving life. In the last decade, we made Israel a world force in economy, in security, in innovation, in science, and we achieved things that nobody dreamt of when we went out of Auschwitz and the Kermatoria just 75 years ago. And now all these achievements are reflected in our very successful coping with a pandemic that the world has never seen before for a hundred years. And this is a proof of what we did. Before we closed the skies, hundreds of thousands of Israelis came back from Berlin, from New York, from London. They came back to Israel because they know one thing. Israel is their home, a warm home for Jews a warm house for our brothers who are not Jews. We saw the soldiers received with love every place, and we saw the very moving picture of an ambulance where two people are praying, a Jewish paramedic and a Muslim paramedic. And uh, we saw the youth and the volunteers who bring food parcels to the elderly in the old age homes. Chapeau to all of you. I salute you. It's time for unity, and with unity, we shall overcome everything. With unity, we will prevail, and we'll pull up our sleeves, and we'll bring back the economy to the eternal success. We will take care of each and every one of you, the self-employed, the, the business people, the work seekers. And there's another thing I wish that next year, please good, we'll put Zoom aside, and we'll all meet together and and hug each other. And until then, citizens of Israel, take care, raise the flag on Independence Day, be happy with your country. But you know, you cannot end without the new orders for the holidays. So when you use the spray, at least do it six feet apart. And now seriously, citizens of Israel, let's say all together, we have a wonderful country. Happy Independence Day, Israel. We see it every day. We see it all over. The volunteers, the singing from the balconies, the care and appreciation of the medical staff, the police, the elderly. But actually, not only during bad times, any day, any place, we Israelis connect. We connect in sounds, in landscapes. We connect in joy and in pain. We connect in common deeds. We connect in love for one another, despite the differences, or maybe because of the differences. We connect so we can go on creating this miracle called the State of Israel. Many voices, but one connected heart. Still, we're different people with different views, different tastes and colors, but also with one ancient tradition to guide us. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. And they shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Uh, we should mention the hosts, uh, the Israeli host, Guy Zuaretz, uh, is a popular entertainment figure. He hosts, I believe, Israel's version of Survivor. And Esther Rada, uh, a very popular Ethiopian performer here, uh, one of several from the Ethiopian community who has become successful in media and entertainment. I do want to go back to Prime Minister Netanyahu's address, Owen. It would have been very simple for Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, to simply address the camera, but Prime Minister Netanyahu is a showman and a communicator, and uh, that was a, whatever your political views were, it just demonstrates his skill in those areas. Well, Kalev, you know, I said a few moments before the ceremony started that is Netanyahu's speech. I said in passing it wouldn't have the theatrics it would otherwise have had, but I obviously spoke too soon, Netanyahu taking full advantage of the fact that this was taped and he could produce a clip ahead of the event, and so, of course, in addition to seeing that moving picture of those two paramedics praying and of course all the pictures of the medical staff and the beautiful landscapes of Israel we just happened to see Donald Trump Narendra Modi Vladimir Putin the Greek and Cypriot leaders and a zoom call that Netanyahu held over the course of the pandemic we saw Sebastian Kurtz the Austrian Chancellor in there at any rate Netanyahu sneaking in there a little bit of what he sees as his own achievements on the international stage this is going to be a controversial speech it's going to be debated around Israel over right, the course of the night also put in there quite bluntly some of the challenges that he and his partner Benny Gantz are going to be facing. He spoke specifically about the recovery that the Israeli economy is going to have to make. We are looking now at something like 25 percent unemployment in Israel, unprecedented. Uh, he talked about, he made very specific reference to certain, even certain sectors of the Israeli economy. For example, uh, the self-employed or independent workers that simply feel that until now they have not been treated right by the Israeli government. They haven't gotten the compensation. Benjamin is you know, promising that he's going to take care of them. So in a sense, laying out the challenge, the very difficult challenge his new government is going to have to face. Oh, there are huge challenges, no doubt. They were brought to bear in that address, in that video. We're all living them day in and day out. And of course, not just Israelis, but people around the world. This is, after all, a global pandemic and an international crisis. Uh, but again, Caleb, I, I think the interspersing within that of those very Netanyahu-esque moments that are, of course, a core part of his own campaign message, I think is going to be a bit controversial. Again, we should remind our viewers, as we said before the as we said before the ceremony, Israeli prime ministers do not generally even speak at this event, let alone speak well, and insert some of their own political. Oh, and I well. was in Israel for its 50th anniversary when Prime Minister Netanyahu was in his first go-round as prime minister back in the 1990s, and in fact. On the 50th anniversary, he did not speak. It was only the Speaker of the Parliament, Dan Tichon. It would be very unlikely that Benjamin Netanyahu, even though they're now partners, in a sense they are, you could say, still rivals, would allow Benny Gantz the opportunity to speak in his current role as Speaker of the Israeli Parliament, the Knesset, when in fact it's quite likely in this very coming week, he is going to be stepping down from that position to assume his new role as defense minister and a sort of de facto uh, co-prime minister in, uh, or co-leader, perhaps we should say. So it's what, uh, certainly if Benny Gantz was going to speak, Benjamin Netanyahu is going to speak. Listen, and of course, Benny Gantz is in no position to object. I mean, these two are entering into a political partnership. Benny Gantz, through his own admission, has staked everything on that partnership. He's put all of his eggs in that basket, so certainly he wouldn't object to it and might not even object to Netanyahu's decision to sneak in his own messaging as part of the address. And of course, you're right, it is a bit of an anomaly that Gantz is even Speaker of the Parliament because, of course, expected to step down from that position shortly under the coalition agreement. That position is going to go to someone from the Likud. That's right, and uh, we should also note Benny Gantz, this is actually going to be, in a sense, almost his first official speech because uh, he did make an address last week just to really explain why he made the decision he made to go break up his blue and white party and go with Benjamin Netanyahu. So this speech coming up just in a few minutes is, in a sense, his debut. Let's go back to the ceremony.
the country. Thanks to Zehava Ben and Avraham Tal, we have love. It shall prevail. These days, we are all going to show us to what extent we are really the chosen people, a society that chooses time and again to be together, to connect and to be connected. And out of this society, this year, 13 people were chosen to kindle the torches, torches of connections. The address by the speaker of the 23rd Knesset, M.K. Benjamin Gantz. Citizens of Israel, here on this mount, between the mountains, is my good friend Nahum Goldberg is also buried. He fell in Lebanon 38 years ago, when I was born, the same date of my birthday. This mountain, which is called after the visionary of the state, Herzl, contains a terrible pain of many families. One war after another, one generation after another. Here, from this mount, year in, year out, we connect between the pain and the strength. This evening, I'd like to disseminate hope out of uh, these soils and under the marble. There are the best of our sons and daughters. Nothing separates them, neither the place where they were born, not their sexual orientation, not their political views. Under the silence of death, all of them are equal. And we have the duty and the responsibility to make sure that all of us are equal in life as well, not identical, similar and equal. Herzl said, we do not ask a person what race or what religion he belongs to. He has to be a human being. This is everything. We were blessed in the state of Israel with many cultures, many languages, and many religions. And just as in the walls of Jerusalem, the stones form a very solid wall that has been standing there for thousands of years. Difficult days are these days, and we have to prepare ourselves for even more difficult days in the future. For seven decades, we had tangible enemies who tried to destroy us and defined for us the common ethos, the ethos of existentialism. Vis-a-vis -vis these enemies, our soldiers are still standing guard, and I salute them. And now we have another enemy which we have never met before. It doesn't distinguish between us, Jews, Arabs, Druze, Cherkes, ultra-Orthodox, religious, secular, right or left, an enemy that puts us to a test and teaches us a national and social lesson about common goals. Each and every one of us is responsible for the life of the other. This common responsibility and the collaboration is our way to overcome this is our way for eternity. In the struggle against this enemy, fighting 
together a medical corps, soldiers, police, and people from the civil, civilian echelons. This is a front, and we all pray for their success in our balconies, from our hearts, and we back them and give them a tailwind. We are going to prevail in this war, and if this lesson, we are going to base a new ethos. A story of mutual responsibility. A story which will not be defined by foreigners, by enemies, but by us. It's not going to be just a war that will bring us back home, like the poem says. But this is going to be something that will unite us within our home, with our different opinions and with the older controversies. This should be the main mission of us, the leaders, citizens of Israel, we are today embarking upon the 72nd Independence Day. And in the 72 years of independence, we went through wars, battles, economic crises, and also political crises. Yes, we always prevailed even when we had to make very harsh decisions. We always united and became strong, and we didn't leave anybody on the side way. I want you to look at us, the variety that we have in this country. Together, we built, and together we shall continue to build the whole, which is bigger the sum than of the details. We are not afraid of challenges. We always look ahead with hope. This is a society where we, the leaders, are taking responsibility. We do everything for you, the citizens of the state. We make sure there's unity and we guard the democracy and the rights of every man. A society which is a little bit brazen, maybe thinking out of the box, but it's also very stable and strong. This is a society which is very Israeli. I will conclude with something that I wish for us more than anything else. This is something that I always say when I became a leader. This is a personal prayer, and especially a national prayer. Bring us peace and make peace among us. Happy Independence Day, Israel. M.K. Benjamin Gantz is going to kindle the torch of the Knesset. I, Benjamin Gantz, the speaker of the Knesset, of my parents who survived the Holocaust and established a village, and I was the chief of staff of the IDF. I have the honor to kindle this torch of the 72nd Independence Day for the State of Israel in honor of the doctors, men and women, and all the medical corps, and the civilian who are facing the corona pandemic and all its implications. In honor of the veteran Israelis, our hearts are with them in their homes or in old age homes. In honor of the soldiers, men and women, police, and all the people of the security forces who are protecting our lives and are mobilized to every mission. In honor and for Oron and and the Hadar of blessed memory, Avera and Hisham, who are MIAs in Gaza, to come back soon, together with all the other MIAs of Israel, in honor of the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, with all its members, and for the glory of the state of Israel.
Minister's Committee, headed by the Minister of Culture and Sports, M.K. Miri Regev, has resolved to hold the ceremony under the title Connections in the Israeli Society. The 12 torches represent connections, a brave decision to choose the good, the common, to choose to see that which unites us, that which unites us together. Ladies and gentlemen, the torch bearers. More than 1,500 stories came to the committee to choose the bearers, out of whom we chose men and women, a mosaics of the Israeli society. Well, we have now begun the uh, torch lighting ceremony, which uh, is a uh, lighting of 12 torches, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. Generally, these are scattered among different individuals of either outstanding achievement uh, in different fields or people that come certainly from different backgrounds. Uh, representing uh, Israeli music here, Edan Reichel, he is one of the, the most significant Israeli musicians in recent years. Uh, he is especially known in his work for incorporating or synthesizing the work of the different cultures in Israel, in particular the uh, Israeli Ethiop Ethiopian Israelis. Uh, he has taken he, one of his, uh, the Edan Reichel project, one particular album that he had incorporated musicians from uh, an Ethiopian background uh, and one international success. And he is, uh, Owen, a, a, a sort of very uh, in with this theme of connecting Israel, because one thing about Edan Reichel is he has bridged together many of the different cultures in Israel through music. That's right, Kalev. And last year, he was part of a song that became a national hit called a, a Brothers and Sisters Singing Together, a tribe of brothers and sisters, I guess is how you translate into English, which was exactly this theme, connecting and bringing together different parts of this very, very complex Israeli society. We're seeing a man on our screens who simply needs no introduction, a major name, not only in Israel, but internationally, with international reputation. You're right, also in keeping with the themes of this event as well. That's right. In fact, he has represented Israel abroad in many uh, sort of uh, events and functions, having found uh, international success. Uh, in his speech, he's paying tribute to certainly uh, his fellow musicians and singers and cultural figures in Israel. He's also saying some words for those who serve in the uh, Israeli armed forces. Uh, incidentally, he is from the Israeli town of Far Saba. Today, of course, the victim, the site of this terror attack that we mentioned. Uh, and he is certainly a figure that reaches across the, I say, the Israeli consensus and even of uh, generations. Absolutely, no question about it. And he's about to light his torch. And again, this is a core part of the ceremony. He's got about to see it over the course of the next few minutes. Again, each of these persons coming up and lighting a torch and ending this is, is talk by saying, and, in, and for the glory of the state of Israel is how they will end his, his speech, as will each of those who lights the torch. He's mentioned 12 torches to symbolize the 12 tribes. Right. We should mention, of course, Adan Reichel is a celebrity. There are a couple of other well-known personalities, but actually the majority of the torchlighters are themselves not celebrities in any, any sense, just people who are doing work uh, worthy of recognition. This year, especially a focus on the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. In fact, uh, this is one of them, very much so. This is uh, Dr. Gila, uh, Professor Gila Rahab. She is the director of the Infectious Diseases Department at the Sheba Medical Center. Very appropriate. The Sheba Medical Center, the one institution maybe that's been a medical institution on the front line in the battle against the coronavirus. That's right. The Tel Aviv Sheba was the first medical center in Israel to absorb the first coronavirus patients who came to Israel from the Diamond Princess in Japan and set up its own complex there. And when I covered that event a few months ago, it seems like years or decades ago, uh, they actually on that day had a delegation of other hospital administrators to come by and learn about how to treat for these patients. And of course, to our sorrow, we've seen many 
of them have to be put on the front lines to do so. And as you mentioned, and as is, of course, appropriate in a time like this, this theme of fighting the pandemic and fighting the virus will be a theme throughout the ceremony. It won't take over the ceremony. Not every one of the torchbearers will be from the health sector or from the sectors fighting the virus, but certainly there will be those. And of course, on our screens, we're seeing one of them and a very, very distinguished doctor and professor, again, at the center of the fight. Right. Of course, she's now paying tribute to her fellow medical professionals who have uh, been taking part, as you said, in the front line. We know the risks that these medical professionals have personally faced. She herself is an outstanding medical medical professional in Israel. In fact, uh, in 2010, she was the first one to di diagnose in Israel a case of what we call a super bug. Someone came back from India with a, uh, one of these uh, bugs that are resistant to antibiotics. So she's used to dealing with extreme circumstances and uh, definitely here is making the case. This is a representative of the people at the top level of those uh, figures. Several of them have become celebrities in Israel, I would say, over the past Absolutely. Week six weeks uh, in terms of their role, uh, almost the equivalent of a Dr. Fauci as we see in America. But we will be seeing people, uh, other torchlighters, more anonymous figures uh, who have been also on the front lines of that fight. And now, of course, uh, she's lighting the torch. Now we're going to have a figure who really does fit in the theme of making connections in Israel. This is Uri Kohn. He's the founder and head of Masa Israeli. Uh, that is a uh, an organization that tra that uh, dedicates itself to strengthening the Zionist Israeli and Jewish identity of high school students. Masa is a journey. Uh, it sort of it, it is a it's what takes pe young people out for a six day special experience. I would almost call it sort of a birthright experience for young Israelis to connect with their heritage. Uh, and uh, Uri Cohen is now the leader of that uh, particular organization uh, and certainly fitting in the theme, making connections, connecting Israel uh, and especially divisions between religious, secular, ultra-Orthodox, national religious. That is a main theme of his group's work. You're absolutely right, Kalev. And you're right, reading and, and watching the clips on this program, it certainly reminded me of programs I remember from growing up in the United United States that are targeted to American Jews. So I think your comparison really, really is apt. And I think a lot of our viewers intuitively understand and know and have experienced what these programs are like. And certainly that is the type of program he's involved in, really trying to engender traditional Zionist and Jewish themes. Uh, which the organizers of this program see as a consensus among sectors in Israeli society. So again, in keeping with the theme of the evening of building bridges and of building connections, uh, this would certainly seem to fit. Yes, and there'll be uh, a few uh, people who fall in the category of educators, I would say, uh, in, during uh, among the torchlighters, again, because these are people who are really involved in trying to make connections between Israelis. Uh, of course, this country knows its divisions. There are people who are in certain subcultures that can be, in a sense, very parochial. And by the way, if you look at the content of this, well, hold on, let's, uh, let's see as Uri Cohn lights his torch. Now, this is uh, representing the young generation. This is 21-year-old Yasmin Mazari. She ticks off several boxes here. First of all, she is works for the Magen David Dome Emergency Rescue Service. That is Israel's famed uh, uh, ambulance service. So she is a first responder in when it comes to the coronavirus. Uh, as I said, she is representing the young generation, only 21. But she is also an Israeli Arab from the uh, community of uh, uh, Nazareth or the area of Nazareth. And uh, we should note many, I would almost say disproportionately, Owen, of the medical professionals in Israel come from the Israeli of Arab community. That's been n remarked on during this coronavirus crisis. Absolutely. You can't, we can't go to a hospital in Israel, go to a doctor's office, walk through the halls of any kind of medical center and not really be struck by the huge participation 
participation in, in that sector by those from the Arab sector. And so, of course, it's fitting, particularly in these times, to honor that participation and that contribution. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. And, of course, it's an important part of Israel's self-image to, to show and to believe that Israel is striving towards co coexistence and towards tolerance. And again, that is exactly the kind of image Israel wants to project to itself on its 72nd birthday. Now we are going to uh, see Eli Ben Shem. He is the chairman of the Yad Labanim organization. That is his family. That is his soldiers and their families. He himself had a personal tragedy uh, when he lost a, uh, uh, I believe it was his uh, son Kobe, in one of the worst military catastrophes in Israel when two helicopters crashed on their way to Lebanon. Seventy-three soldiers on board both helicopters were killed. And he's representing the bereaved, those that have lost loved ones uh, uh, on the front lines, of course, very fitting in with uh, in Memorial Day. Uh, and that, of course, is a mainstay of Israeli society. Unfortunately, makes that so valuable, the work of Yad Lebanon, the organization that he's uh, working with. Right. And I think here, in addition to honoring the bereaved families themselves, Kalal, I think it also is honoring the effort to help the bereaved families, the idea and the initiative to be part of this nonprofit, to be part of this NGO, to lead it and to have it be there to help the bereaved families. And again, also an appropriate part, again, of building connections and of building Israel's nonprofit sector. This is a very, very important and well-known organization. So again, also part of this mosaic of Israeli society that our hosts were describing ahead of the torch lighting. And one interesting fact uh, that shows you maybe the connectivitiness of, or the, of Israeli society, his son Kobe, who we lost in that helicopter uh, uh, accident, was a friend of Adan Rabin. Michael. Absolutely. It's a small country, and there are plenty of personal connections in addition to the social connections that we're drawing, uh, again, with these very, very different people representing different faces of Israeli society and facets of Israeli society who are one by one coming up to light each of those 12 torches. We should know that Eli, uh, uh, El, Eli Ben Sham and uh, Yad Labanim supported the government's decision that families should not go to cemeteries over Memorial Day. Controversial, but really uh, put into place to prevent any spread of coronavirus at, at, in these places. Maybe making it all the more important and all the more poignant to honor bereaved families and the organization that helps support them on this most prominent of Israeli stages. Very much because they had to make a sacrifice on Israeli Memorial Day to forego that ritual, almost sacred ritual, uh, in order of going to the military cemeteries on that day. Now, we, we, mentioned, uh, we mentioned the role of Israeli Arabs in medical services. Here, this is quite interesting. We now have two nurses. And of course, nurses, we talk about people on the front line of this corona epidemic. Nurses, perhaps the ones most potentially directly affected by it. Uh, so joining together here is Ahmed Balwane, excuse me, Balwane, and Yael Velozhny, an Arab and a Jewish nurse. They do work at different institutions, coming together, representing here the nursing industry, which really has been so vital over the past two months here in Israel. Of course, in Israel, as in so many parts of the world, Kalev, these are the pictures that we see on our screens when we honor, honor the heroes of the moment, those working in the medical center, those in the front lines, in addition to those at senior levels, and we saw that earlier on in the, cemetery, in the ceremony, also those on the front lines, truly on the front lines, working and volunteering to fight this pandemic, to cure for patients, putting themselves at risk of being infected in order to do so, and again, 
here seeing a Jew and an Arab on that screen together and now on that stage together. Again, I think, again, Kalev, part of the image that Israel wants to project to itself and, for that matter, to the world on its 72nd birthday of cooperation and coexistence between Jews and Arabs, again, against a virus, Kalev, that, as the cliche goes, doesn't discriminate between different types of people, doesn't discriminate between Jews and Arabs. We heard that again from Benny Gantz a few moments ago. And now, again, we're seeing it on our screen that the fight against it also can bring out the best in all of us and bring out cooperation across sectoral lines. Right, and we, we should note, Owen, and let's not sugarcoat it, in many ways Israeli Arabs live in communities very often segregated from the Israeli Jewish mainstream. Uh, but one place where that separation has broke down, and it's been noted before, is in Israeli hospitals, where people there, not only as patients, but as I mentioned before, the medical staff in Israel is what, one of the most integrated, if maybe the most most integrated uh, professions in Israel. That's right. And of course, we've seen of course, over the course of the last few years, Kalev, the treatment of Syrians in Israeli hospitals, which even accentuates that even more. And again, of course, in this moment in the fighting of the pandemic. Now, this is a fairly extraordinary woman. Now we're talking about people who are volunteers. And in many Israeli uh, hospitals and medical centers, many people work there as volunteers, not professionals. This is Reina Abutbul. She is 92 years old. She is the grandmother of 42 grandchildren and 16 great-grandchildren, and she volunteers at the Sharei Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. Uh, and she uh, is an immigrant from Morocco. Uh, it is uh, quite extraordinary. And, you know, we talk about, especially during the coronavirus, this situation, the dangers poses mainly to Israel's elderly. And it's just this woman. I, I think it's just, an, just amazing. This is Israel's greatest generation, Kalev, and we see them continuing to contribute, even at an age like 92. should also mention she was, in the original plan, meant to be paired with the young Arab woman who was, I think, lighted, lit the second torch. And they were supposed to light together. There's a particular reason why they were split to make the number of 12. Maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Someone who was supposed to light and in the end could not do so herself. Right. Uh, now, the people say that this Reina Butbul is still volunteering. She is beloved by the staff there at Sharei Tzedek Hospital. Uh, she comes in mainly to just comfort the uh, patients there. Uh, uh, she, they say that she, she brings delicious, I presume, homemade biscuits to come. People that go into Israeli hospitals know, in particular, nurses may be uh, overtaxed. The role, the important role played by these kind of volunteers. That's especially for many people here who don't have family to support them at those times. Right, and Kelly, before the same... Well, we saw some. We saw some of her family, not the 42, she was 16 great grandchildren. But imagine, she was an unknown. She wasn't Idan Reichel. She wasn't a household name. But now everyone knows who she is. Right. Now this is uh, Yisrael Al Masi, who is now going to be uh, the next torchlighter. It's, he's the director of Yedi Deem. Now this is also a network of 20,000 volunteers. Quite interesting. They actually started uh, in 2005 to help Israelis stuck on who are either in road accidents or stuck on the side of the road, kind of like what we think of AA uh, in the United States. But, of course, these things cost money. Many Israelis don't have the financial resources for that. And this organization was originally founded to help people stuck on the side of the road, but really has exp uh, AAA, I should say. Uh, it has expanded, though, in recent years, especially to help elderly people, including at all kinds of assistance they may need at home, and, of course, how crucial that has become uh, in the coronavirus uh, uh, period when many elderly people are stuck at home and even those with families, their families can't get to them necessarily. Because another remarkable organization and not the last one, by the way, that we're going to see over the course of this ceremony. There's at least another one that's just a remarkable organization. And again, showing again the nonprofit sector having really strong representation in this ceremony. And again, many, many wonderful nonprofits here in Israel. And again, we're seeing some of them on stage and highlighting. 
and it's really wonderful to see. It is. And uh, again, to go back to the, the, the situation, as I said before, this organization started with one particular focus to help people along on roadside and has grown well beyond that mission now, helping the elderly uh, and that uh, the most vulnerable population, certainly during this coronavirus situation. That's right. And again, a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. Now, this, the next uh, uh, torchlighter is Adi Alchula. She is 33 years old. She has a remarkable resume for a woman of just 33. She actually founded a number of uh, nonprofit incredible, incredible. organizations. Uh, the most notable one is called Krembo Wings. Now, that is a youth movement in Israel. We associate youth movements with either different political streams or the scouting movement. This was Israel's first youth movement specifically for uh, young people with special needs. It's called Krembo Wings. Krembo is a, a popular is a uh, treat for young people, uh, and she in fact also founded a second uh, organization called Zikaron Besalon. This is uh, uh, bringing private individuals, survivors of the Holocaust, into uh, I guess salon meetings to convey their memories, their messages, and lessons of the Holocaust. So crucial because, of course, with each passing year, we are losing more and more of the survivors, especially. This year, unfortunately. Caleb, two nonprofits that are simply institutions in Israeli society, Krembo Israeli society, and you're right, really filling a niche that is so important to so many families and hadn't really been addressed. And Zikaron Basalon, again, focused with its activities on the Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day that we commemorated last week. And again, you know, we're experiencing a lot of these ceremonies are very, very important parts of Israeli culture, but they can seem a bit distant. And the idea of Zikaron Basalon was to make it much more more personal and to have much smaller group meetings on the night of Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, for a much more personal experience of meeting a survivor and collab again with so many of these survivors, unfortunately, leaving us year in, year out, more important than ever. So again, shows the, the startup nation in the nonprofit arena as well. It certainly does. Imagine this woman is 33 and has founded these two well-established, now successful NGOs. I want to point out that her resume includes a stint at Google, uh, Google for Education. This is a woman who obviously could have had a, a sterling career in the high-tech world. Instead, she's used her skills, uh, used that, uh, you mentioned Startup Nation, all that talent in the non-governmental uh, arena, uh, helping uh, marginalized sides of Israeli society, truly a worthy recipient uh, to be a torchlighter. Uh, absolutely. ולתפארת מדינת ישראל. Now, now, our next uh, torchlighter, Lori Palatnik, uh, she is a representative uh, here of the diaspora. We are actually going to hear her speak uh, in English. She founded an organization called Momentum, which has been called Birthright for Mommies, connecting people through Israel, but we're not talking about young people uh, necessarily in this case. Uh, and this is a fairly, as you can see here on the screen now, get a sense of bringing um, uh, these women, we're talking about adult women and connecting uh, through Israel. Uh, and of course, oh, she will be speaking in English. She's representing the diaspora, something a relatively new here in Israel's independence day, just the last few years. That's right, again, diaspora representatives often coming to the stage uh, to light one of the 12 torches. And we see it right here before us, and she's about to speak. She'll be speaking in English. So we'll listen to her. תעלה המסועה. אני לורי פלטניק, דודר אוף פייגה בת רייזו, מי שי בי וואל. אניור בן חיים שמו הלוי, זיכרון לברכה, מציעה מסועה זו. לכבוד Jewish women all over the world that in these times are keeping their families together and strong. לכבוד 
the profound mifgash between Israeli mothers and their sisters in the diaspora. Achdut v'lo achidut. Lichvot, Jewish communities across the globe who form the fabric of Jewish life in the diaspora. Lichvod, our future, our children, including our son Zev and all the other chayelim bodedim. In the merit of the righteous women, we were redeemed from Mitzrayim. Be'ezrat Hashem. We will emerge from this time to rebuild even stronger. Chazak nashim. Chazak. Ulitaferet Medinat Yisrael. A mix of Hebrew and English there from Lori Polotnik. Uh, the next uh, uh, torchlighter representing Israel's armed forces, this is Colonel Hisham Ibrahim. He is a, one of the senior officers from Israel's uh, uh, Army Corps. Maybe also, more importantly, he is a member of the Jewish community. And Owen, we have to say, unlikely that it's a coincidence that this year's torchlighter was chosen for, for the military, was chosen from Israel's Jews minority. That's right. First of all, again, trying to bring a mosaic of Israeli society. It's been a theme of this event. And again, the idea of representation of non-Jews has been very, very important. And of course, this is in the background of legislation over the course of the past couple of years of Israel's nation state law that is very, very much upset as you well know, Kalev, the Druze community here, again, that law describing Israel as the state of the Jewish people and in the view of its critics, giving Jews pride of place here in a way that hadn't been true in the, in the past. There are, of course, supporters of the law who say that that's, not, that, that that's not the case, but it engendered some opposition in the Druze sector. And there's been, and again, the Druze are, are very, very popular across the political spectrum in Israel. So it makes sense as a part of this ceremony in terms of the image Israel wants to broadcast to itself to have the Druze community embraced. Uh, uh, we should know, uh, uh, as, uh, as Hisham speaks, that Benny Gantz, uh, when he was running uh, for office, did say that he would amend, make some amendments to that law, that the nation-state law that you talked about, uh, particularly aspects that the Jew, some in the Jewish community found objectionable. Uh, it'll be one of the interesting issues in this government but with him and Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and certainly as you say the Jews community respected across the board here in Israel and uh, he representing now uh, that community in the torch lighting. That's right. And again, the participation of Druze, particularly in the Israeli military, including at senior levels, is the greatest symbol of their integration into Israeli society. And again, you see, we see that on our screens right now as part of this ceremony symbolizing Israel's Independence Day. And he's about to light the torch. Well, now we're going back to show business and celebrity. This is Sipi Shavit. As every Israeli child, anyone who is, grew up here knows her. She's an actress, a singer, entertainer, but really, especially when it comes to a children's, she's children's entertainment on television and on the stage. Uh, I would almost describe she's like a very high energy uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, you might say. I mean, she is an Israeli icon uh, and uh, certainly a worthy recipient. She just has brightened uh, Israeli children now for generations. That's right, Kalev. We opened this torch lighting ceremony with Idan Reichel, a household name in Israel and abroad, and now we are ending it with Tzipi Shavit, again, a household name, at least here in Israel. We should also, though, note, again, in keeping with the times, for the most prominent entertainers who are coming out to light these torches, it's one thing, but of course, the sector of entertainment and music has been so hard hit by the pandemic that we also have to keep in mind the many, many thousands of people, not only here in Israel, but around the world, who are really suffering from that sector. And one can only hope for better times for them, and that in the meantime, they can find a way to share their art with others in a, in a different way and still be able to have a livelihood. Right, it's Sippy Shavit and her remarks uh, making note of that. 
that that the the uh, Israeli entertainers, performers, are, especially in during this period, these past couple of months, have played such a role in sort of lifting, boosting the the national morale, as that they have done in other countries, certainly in the U.S. as we see. Uh, and of course, as you said, they're suffering financially. Theaters, maybe the maybe the last venues that are business venues that are open here, just by the nature of it, and financially, so many of these performers uh, really depend on live performance. And don't ignore Yom Ha'atzmaut, Israel's Independence Day itself, Kalev. Those stages in every town and city and hamlet, those were stages on which performers were paid often a lot of money to perform. Those stages are all dark tonight. We are all in our homes. And again, a symbol of how these people are, are suffering. Right, I think you can get, even without understanding your Hebrew, just the ebullient style uh, of Tzipi Shavit. Uh, she just talked about looking happy to the, looking forward to the days when Israelis can hug and kiss each other uh, together in affection. <laughs> Uh, and as we, that concludes the torch lighting, now we are looking at the firework celebration of Bob Jerusalem. Now I have to say, Owen, that usually in every every not just city, really just almost about in every community in Israel, there are usually firework celebrations. Most of them have been canceled this evening. But the one in Jerusalem was allowed to go ahead. Uh, let's take a listen to some of the performances there at on Harhutzel. As I said, though, when we saw the uh, firework celebration in Jerusalem, in other communities, uh, most of them, they were canceled, including here in Tel Aviv. 